Kitchen Brain. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Kitchen Brain Podcast, Season 1, Episode 9. Today, I'm talking to Lindsay Ofkasik, who is both the co-founder and director for the Lee Initiative, uh, which launched in late 2017 and has a mission of addressing issues of diversity and equality in the restaurant industry. Uh, Since its launch, uh, Lindsay has created several programs under the program's umbrella, including Women Chefs of Kentucky, Restaurant Workers Relief Program, Restaurant Reboot Relief Program, Regrow, and McAtee Community Kitchen. Uh, before uh, starting the Lee Initiative, uh, Lindsay worked with Chef Edward Lee at 610 Magnolia, serving as general manager and wine director. She is still the wine director at 610 and uh, has been in every facet of the industry from uh, farming to cooking to managing to distribution. Uh, you name it, she's done it. And uh, super excited to have her on the show to, to share all of the exciting things that she's doing to, to provide relief for restaurant workers and farmers uh, around the nation through the Lee Initiative and all of the other projects that they're a part of. Lindsay, how are you? I'm doing well, and I'm super grateful for you having us on um, to learn more about the Lee Initiative and what we do. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I kind of want to start uh, in the beginning. I don't want to dive. We'll, 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 we'll gradually ease into it. I don't think it's fair to just dive right into a pandemic uh, right off the bat. So <laughs> um, let's let's go to the beginning, because I'm really curious about this, because, um, you, you know, you were full time general manager, wine director of 610 Magnolia. Uh, and then this transition happened where you uh, you co-founded. Um, and when I say co-founded, it's with Edward Lee. Is he? He's the other founder, correct? Yes, it's the two of us. Yeah. So you you, you started, started this. In a very humble <laughs> gotcha. So what what was the motivation? What what kind of sparked uh, the conversation and the the uptick of Lee Initiative? Yeah. So in late 2017. Um, the two of us, like the rest of the world, sat and watched as the Me Too movement kind of had a reckoning, as we call it, on our industry. Um, a lot of behaviors and environments were brought to light about the culinary industry. Yes, we knew they existed. Yes, we had all had our fair share of it. But it was really, um, it really hit hard for us what some women were facing in the culinary industry. Well, that was... The story of men, it was not mine. Um, and it, it, it hurt. You know, this is an industry that I'm raising my family. Um, and I took it very personally. I think it was the same person who is raising a young daughter in this industry. You know, for every bad chef, there are an army of good ones behind them. Not negating you know, the situations that happened and that were brought to light, they needed to be brought to light and they were wrong. But that doesn't, you know, the media doesn't get to paint an entire industry based on the bad behaviors of few men. Um, and so we started to throw around several different ideas of like, how do we make a difference? Like this industry is important to us. Um, and so we, I, I'm not kidding when I say we threw around a thousand ideas, we probably did. And we landed on mentorship. You know, something that was different for me is that the entire longevity of my career, I have had really amazing women leaders and mentors um, me along the way. And again, I'm not saying I've never had a bad experience. I have, but I've always had really strong female leaders in life. Um, especially in this industry. And so we, we founded the Lee Initiative and the Women Chefs Program. And the program was essentially created to allow for staging and mentorship and community building for women, or, for women in our industry. Um, you, you work as a chef in this industry and you totally understand that typically the way that you get a leg up is through staging. Staging is working free in very expensive city that works for a 
very small subset of people. (laughs) Um, And so we wanted to change that. And so we founded the Women Chefs of Kentucky. Very cool. Um, so, so what's kind of the, the bones of, of that program? How, how is that structured? How do you get into that program? Um, how does that all work? Yeah. Um, so traditionally we do a call for applicants. Um, this program was originally open to chefs in Kentucky, Southern Indiana and Ohio. We focused regionally because you always start in your own backyard. Um, and we put out a call to action. Chefs could fill out an application on our website. Uh, we got it, you know, I think the first year we had 275 applicants. We got it down to five, um, which is fun and gut-wrenching. <laughs> this is all I can say, but we got it down to five mentees. Um, and we have a whole selection committee. It's not just me, you know, Chef Lee recuses himself. We have cookbook authors. People. It's, it's a whole team of people that help with us. Um, those women are selected and announced immediately after some of the cool things they do. Um, they go on to Maker's Mark and make their own very special bourbon blend. I'm having it right now. <laughs> uh, they went to Jenny's Ice Cream. They come up with their own ice cream flavor to represent the Lee Initiative. Um, they work on butchering workshops with you know, folks from Chicago and New York that are considered best butchers in this country. And then they go and spend a week or two, depending on where they are, um, with a woman who has risen the ranks from line cook to owning their own restaurant. These are small names. You know, they go and work with Nina Compton. They work with Ashley Christensen, work with, you know, Katie Button. Like these are incredible women who have done they have done the thing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, rock stars. Um, yeah, total rock. Uh, Jen Lewis, and it's it's incredible to see because when we started the program, we we thought that they would go and like work with them for a week or two, and then you know maybe be there as like a mentor if you have a question. But I I talk to mentees all the time, and I still talk to each of them probably monthly, sometimes more. And their mentors call them and say, hey, you know, how's it going? What's going on in your, in your career? And if they have a short answer, it's that's not good enough. We're going to have to have a call. <laughs> like, they're very invested in them um, as a whole. And it's incredible to see. And, you know, then the kind of the swan song of our program is they get to create their entire meal at the James Beard House in New York. Wow. So they do five courses for five chefs. Um, They work with the media, they do the whole thing. And it's it's amazing to watch them grow from beginning to end and see their confidence build. More incredible to see is later when we have the next in their confidence and where they've gone in their career. And that every single woman in this program reaches out to the next class. You know, now they're an entire network. Right. Um, that is growing together. And that's been awesome to see. So we had just announced our third class whenever COVID hit. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so, yeah, <laughs> our organization has changed greatly. <laughs> I'm sure there are so many stories now that end with, and then COVID. And then COVID. Um, I will say, I still talk to each of the chefs in the third class who gotten to do anything except for make a bourbon <laughs> because COVID because but COVID. you know it it there's still a supportive network they still all you know rally for each other and they're there for ideas and it's been awesome that's cool that's really cool um what stage are they generally at what the mentees when they start oh. like what's are, are they working chefs? Are they sous chefs? Are they line cooks? What, what, what is the selection like there? I will be totally honest with you. It varies. Um, when we look at applicants for the women's chefs, it is not just what you do in your career. Um, it, it's your dedication to service and mentorship. You know, I, I can teach, we can teach you to cook. We can teach you a lot of things. We cannot teach work ethic and we cannot teach service and like the call to action to be supportive. So 
we have chefs, um, you know, coming to mind, Jen Rock in the first class was 35 years old. She was just promoted to executive chef of pharmacy in Tennessee. Um, we also had Rihanna Baker, who is 20 years old. She turned 21 in the program. She was wow. freshly out of culinary school and she was just promoted to sous chef at 610. So there's a wide variety of chefs in our program. The one thing that they have in common is that they are positive and supportive and that they fight for each other and they fight for the community. Very cool. Very cool. So uh, let's, let's pick up at the, uh, the, the end of that sentence when COVID happened. Uh, yeah. because, uh, back in, in March, uh, you had to make kind of a, a shift, um, and, and mobilize in a different way. Uh, and yeah. I, I listened to your, your podcast interview that you did on Southern Fork. And, uh, so I, I know a little bit about this, um, but it's, it's incredible, uh, how quickly <laughs> you all reacted to it. Um, Talk, talk to me about that. What, what, what happened when COVID hit and you had to kind of pause the, uh, the, the, the program, uh, the mentorship program, what, what was the meeting like then? Yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, we, we had just introduced our class of mentees literally that Sunday we had um, that Monday, there was talk that our governor was going closed on restaurants in Kentucky, things tend to tumble downhill a little later. So we were like, Oh, we've got some time. <laughs> we did not have time. Yeah. Um, that day he said, okay, at five o'clock today, every restaurant in the state of Kentucky will close. So I had a group of mentees here, uh, who were going back to work, you know, it's restaurant world. So it was Monday, they were going back on Tuesday. They all kind of looked at me and said, okay, we probably just effectively lost your jobs we can stay here and help what are you going to do chef lee fed tsa workers and federal employees during a government shutdown earlier th that year um or last year so we had a template for how to convert into relief how to do like mass feeding in a relief center i called him and said okay, here we are like we have all of this staff we have all of this food coming out of nowhere. Um, what are we going to do? Like every other restaurant and hotel is also going to have a ton of. And so we quickly were like, okay, we're going to open a store um, in our wine cellar that has formula, diapers, toilet paper, paper towels, like household goods. And we're going to cook every bit of food in this building and we're going to produce 300. We can do this. We put a post on Instagram, um, called our partners at Maker's Mark, and they were like, yeah, sure, we'll help you. Like, here's $5,000. It'll be fine. <laughs> uh, that day, we were out of food in an hour, and we you know, saw that this need was going to be huge. You know, These were people that had lost their job to no fault of their own. It's an industry where people typically don't have a safety net. And so Maker's Mark being awesome, like, you know, of course they helped financially, but they were also there as volunteers. Um, they looked at us and said, this is going to happen everywhere. And it was, yep, it totally is. Like, this is not going away. Right. That being said, we thought it would last like two to three weeks, but um, they, you know, if we can help you, money do you want to do this everywhere you know in other cities we said yes of course and they were able to pull a financial budget together where they scraped um on prem budgets that weren't going to happen because of covid and we were able to launch relief centers in 20 cities at wow. 23 locations um within the next two weeks we've effectively fed 650,000 families through that program. And we kept them open for three months. You know, we thought it would be two weeks. It was three months. <laughs> you, you got those open in two weeks? We did. Um, we had the first five open in two days. So <laughs> it, when I say that Chef Lee slept in shifts, 
I'm not kidding. <laughs> you know, and that's, and, and it's, it just is what it is. And it, yes, it was hard, but I can honestly tell you, like when I reflect back on COVID and when it first started, I wouldn't trade places with anyone. I never felt helpless. Never, ever, ever felt helpless in this situation. Every sing, single thing that we were doing, we knew would have an impact on our industry. Right. Where, so where are these locations as far as what facilities are these locations for these relief centers? Yeah, so they're all in restaurants. They're all independent restaurants across the country. Um, so when we first closed, we called Eduardo Jordan, it, um, Solaire and June Baby in Seattle and said, hey, if we give you $50,000, can you like, don't lay off your staff, just produce relief meals. And we'll set up a portal where you can fundraise for your own city. Um, well, every bit of money raised through Seattle will come directly back to you. We did the same with Mita's in Cincinnati. We did the same with Nancy Silverton in LA. Um, we had two kitchens in New York, one at Gertie's in Brooklyn and one at um, Olmstead in Brooklyn. You know, trying to, fo like we were very calculated and focused on one restaurants that we knew and trusted because we had no time to vet anyone in this sure. situation. It was moving so quickly but also um, neighborhoods where service industry people live. You know, we didn't want to encourage people getting on public transportation. This also happened, you know, the second week of March where there were no COVID guidelines yet. Right, yeah. So when I say that we were sleeping in shifts, it was literally during the day, phone call, phone call, funding, funding. And then this, the third part was like, how do we keep these people safe? How do we do this? Um, and I can very proudly say that of all 20 relief centers, only, or 21 relief centers total, um, only one closed from a COVID infection and we were able to move it the next day. Um, I feel like we very effectively with little to no guidance figured out how to make this. Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um... So I, you know, I would imagine the, the Maker's Mark uh, contribution went pretty far, but were, were there other donations along the way? I mean, did you have to expand uh, kind of the, the net that you cast for yeah. funds? <laughs> yes. Um, so partnerships that I never imagined we would have just a <laughs> community matched dollar for dollar every corporate donation that we received. People who would, you know, from shaky handed little old ladies who would send a check and say like, I didn't eat out this week, here's $25 to people who would donate through our online portal um, and say, you know, we didn't, you know, it was my kid's birthday and we didn't eat at our favorite pizza place, here's 10 bucks. Like that was incredible. Um, it, I will say COVID really sucks, but I never realized how important independent restaurant workers and their staff are to culture and community and to individual people. <laughs> it was incredible. Um, the partnerships that I never thought we would have. American Airlines has food hubs all over the country filled with yogurt and breakfast and food. They mobilized immediately and got, I shouldn't say thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds of food to these relief centers to pass out. Wow. Um, Audi luxury car brand <laughs> sent us 30 Q sevens to move food across this country. You know, they had all of these vehicles and they sent fleets of vehicles out to help and support us. Um, Humana, the healthcare company mm -hmm. sent us, you know, not only financial contributions, but also they started a, you know, they had this community <clears throat> response hotline where every person who came to one of our relief centers across the country could have this card that told them everything from like, here's the phone number to call if you need food. Here's the phone number to call if you need mental health. Here's the phone number to call if you need telehealth. Like, this is how you do it. And there was a team of people on the other side of the phone, because again, these are people that have never needed aid before. So putting together, like, you can't just walk into an urgent care center. Sure. Um, and they contributed this resource. They gave you all of those things. Um, wow. That's awesome. Um, so that, that kind of leads to, 
you you guys discovered a lot, I think, about the industry. Correct me if I'm wrong. Once you started going through all this, I mean, you know, it's no secret that the industry um, has some aspects of it that are broken and and need to be uh, improved upon. But I think that COVID, you know, one thing that I've always said, speaking to different guests, uh, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm I'm the chef of a private country club. Um, you're working with with a, 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 a well known celebrity chef uh, at Six Ten Magnolia. Um, you know, you see all these different places, but one thing that COVID did, it kind of leveled the, like it kind of made us all the same, uh, and exposed that we all have, uh, common issues that we need to deal with. And, and I think that that's sort of a positive thing. Um, and I think a lot of opportunities have presented themselves. Uh, and, and I've always said too, I mean, if we wind up coming out, you know, when we get to normal and we will get to normal, um, when we come out the other side, if we go back to exactly the same as it was before this, then we've missed some opportunities. Uh, oh, of course. So yeah. What, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I guess gonna... my... <laughs> you go. I was going to say, speaking of country club chefs, I will tell you, um, in the thick of this, you know, obviously seeing people that you know and love except aid for the first time is emotionally taxing. There's also a global pandemic happening and you don't know where like, you know, world, like where the world is going, but also your food in a way that you've never made food before. I have to give a huge shout out, like Oxmoor country club. There were three or four different country clubs that reached out and they, they were used to doing mass caterings. They called and immediately were like, Hey, give your chefs two days off a week. We want to make the food for them. And they would make all of the food and deliver them to 610 and check up on our chefs. Like, awesome. and it, it really brought together this sense of community. Like it doesn't matter what kind of chef you are. <laughs> like You're all in this together. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, I mean, you know, aside from the, the obvious, I mean, obviously there were some serious uh, food supply issues that have been exposed, uh, or even just yeah. product, product supply issues. Um, and yes, you know, we might not have seen them if there weren't a pandemic to this magnitude, but, um, you, you've gotten to really experience those up close. Um, what, what have you seen, I, you know, exposed more, uh, in the industry that we probably need to keep focusing on as we move forward? I mean, you know, honestly, I, I don't like through this, I don't really focus like the problem we've seen in the industry. Yes. You know, they're there. And I, I hate to like, as we look at, I, I more so focus on rebuilding. So like you said, there are problems in this industry that we should not go back to given the opportunity, things like the Lee initiative in its, you know, beginning, were small steps to help improve an industry. Given the option, we'd all make small steps to make real change in the industry, but it would go slow. We were not given that option. COVID broke this shit to the ground. Like (laughs) it blew it up. Like it's not, you know, so when we go to rebuild our industry, I really hope that we do, you know, focus on fairness, women in leadership, I hope to see us look more locally with food um, and sourcing. And that's part of the restaurant reboot uh, program where we invest in small farms to create credits for restaurants as they're reopening. I will tell you that every single partner that we went to when we said, what do you want, you know, like, how can we help you reopen? Their hearts were with their local farmers you know, their dairies, their protein providers, their, you know, all of these small producers. And they were like, you know, we, we don't know. It's more expensive. Like we don't know what under the current restrictions, if we can afford. It. And that's why we started reboot because we knew that they wanted to continue those relationships and what separates independent restaurants from corporate restaurants is the product that they serve. You know, they focus on, sourcing regionally and locally and these like niche, you know, products. And 
I mean, that's why we did reboot. We wanted to invest in that program and have them, you know, still be able to support the small family farms. So how does, how does the reboot program work exactly? Yeah. So every city that we went to, uh, for relief, you know, they were open for three months. We went to them and said, like, how are you going to reopen? And they all wanted to focus on products that they didn't necessarily have money for. So we had them sponsor, you know, in a lot of cities, it was five in Chicago, it was 20, 27 farms. Um, and we, 10 to $20,000 investment said, just create a credit and these restaurants can open for, like order from you at no cost to them as they reopen. So it was a way to help with food costs to forge this relationship with farms and the restaurants that we're already starting to see can as the grant runs out. Sure. I think if we can all focus more recently on our food systems, they're much more stable. Right. Wow. Um, so with regard to uh, the, the, the workforce out there, I know you, you mentioned the safety net or the lack of a safety net um, that, that we kind of see. Uh, and we saw even more when this all went down. Um, yeah. You know, restaurant, I, I think it, it's interesting. It was interesting oh. in the beginning when, when we all found out that we're essential employees uh, yeah. and, and we're essential businesses. <laughs> Uh, but it was a bit contradictory um, because we're essential, but we can't really operate um, to to a certain level. Uh, but you know, everybody that that volunteers for you, or most of the people that volunteer for you, are restaurant workers. Uh, so, there's restaurant and yeah, like bartenders, people that work for liquor brands, you know, and that's the thing. COVID, like. It, it was a chain reaction. Everyone from people that work in hotels to people, you know, actually restaurant chefs or people that are working in the warehouse at a brand, you know, we all lost our jobs at the same time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, so anybody uh, listening to find out um, and, and read up on the, uh, all the programs that Lee Initiative does, uh, I want to make sure that I get this in. Um, leeinitiative.org is the website. Uh, you could also follow on Instagram. Uh, the handle is at Lee Initiative. And uh, Chef Edward Lee is, is always posting things uh, pertaining to Lee Initiative. Also, uh, his Instagram is at Chef Edward Lee. Um, just want to make sure I, I, I get all that out before, uh, before we get all, all the way to the end. Um, so thinking ahead, and, and I know you're kind of in the now, and, and it looks like we have a bit more time uh, left on this. Um, so first I, I, I would like for, for people to know, um, you know, at this point, how can they help, uh, and, and how do they get in touch with you about, uh, contributing, whether it's, uh, labor or, or a financial investment? Um, is that all through the website or are there things that different restaurants can do to contribute? Yeah, I mean, it's mostly through the website, through leeinitiative.org. They can also, as an idea, you know, please, we're, we're a small staff of four people. <laughs> Just reach out to us. Um, you can, Lindsay at leeinitiative.org is my personal email. You can always reach out to me. Um, you know, programs occur through those ideas all the time. We just, our biggest program was launched today. So, wow. and that is, um, we partnered with Churchill Downs, um, which I'm sure you're familiar with is the biggest, you know, it's the racetrack where the Kentucky Derby is run. Yeah. Their kitchen is the size of a football field. Um, we were able to partner with them, and hire 50 out of work chefs throughout the city to produce um, 8,000 meals a week for public schools, wow. you know, and those ideas came about through someone calling us <laughs> so okay. please do that if you have an idea <laughs> okay sounds good so long term um you know obviously you know when when we get back to to normal the the mentoring program i'm sure we'll we'll be back in full swing um but the the kind of the infrastructure that you have created through the pandemic 
Uh, is there any talk yet about what that becomes? Does that turn into a long-term sustainable program that uh, contributes in some way to the industry? To, like the restaurant relief and like feeding people. Yeah. Um, we, we will do this as long as it's necessary. We are, you know, we have high hope we can look towards, you know, next year, at least middle of next year and our businesses rebuild and regrow. You know, one thing is for women in the industry, I think it's, um, it, the stats are staggering. It was like 900,000 women left the hospitality industry this year and 200,000 men. We don't know what that is exactly. A lot of it is probably like NTI and like parenting and, you know, taking on more of those responsibilities. And we don't want to lose the ground that we've gained, you know, for women in leadership. And we really want to go back in full force with women chefs. Um, we plan to expand that program nationally. We're also working on several grant programs. We do regrow where we do small grants into independent restaurants just to help bridge payroll and electricity to get them back on their feet. So we, we plan to look more into those as well. Gotcha. How do you find time uh, to be the wine director at 610 Magnolia? Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, being the wine director right now is not super fun. It's more of a fire sale of my wine cellar <laughs> that we've been collecting. Um, you know, it honestly, like I get to be on the floor and like some, you know, probably once a week, maybe once every two weeks. And it's super fun for me. It's, uh, going back to how things used to be. And right. it's a, it's a reminder that like things are going to normal and things are going to okay um it's also i <laughs> i am a full-time parent of a four six-year-old that's doing virtual learning <laughs> so and i think you're a parent as well so you understand this and, you know in the morning it's nti i'm fortunate to have a a teacher to help with our homeschooling our kids and then you know we work on the initiative stuff during the day and then at night we do one so <laughs> Sounds cool. It's, it's busy stuff, but man, you, you guys are, um, I've just been in awe of, uh, of everything that you've been doing through this whole thing. And, uh, when I heard the stats of, of the, um, the reach that you had, uh, in such a short amount of time, um, it's just staggering to me. And, uh, you know, I want to, I, I want to play a small part in getting the word out. Um, <laughs> And in any way that I can. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know, like I said, the, the original draw uh, for me to the initiative was was the equality piece. Um, and, you know, I, I guess my question to you is, and, and obviously you're you're working hard on it and putting a lot of time into it. Um, where, where do you think we are right now in that respect? Um, and And what do you think where, where do you think we need to go? I mean, w w what's the state of that situation in the industry as far as gender equality and, um, you know, just being more balanced? I mean, yeah, I mean, with equality as a whole, based on women, people of color, people from diverse backgrounds, we're at the beginning. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do. And we'll get there. You know, programs, you know, mentorship programs, um, you know, corporate, there, there are a ton of ways to get there. And I think that everyone, everyone is listening. And I get back to like, why would we rebuild a broken system? You know, I see women and people of color, minorities, all of these things at the forefront of rebuilding this industry. Um, and I just hope that with that momentum up. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Uh, I like I like how you say that. Because um, what? Why would you want to rebuild something that you know is is admittedly uh, not a good system? Um, you know, we we essentially need to come up with a new model and and start over from there uh, and and build something uh, that makes sense and uh, and works for everybody. So um, that that's pretty cool. I like uh, I like that. 
Um, we talked about, um, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's my big focus in like going into 2020 is just to always rebuild a system that works for everyone. <laughs> and this system historically has not. So we need to work on that. I agree. I agree. Uh, so we talked about Maker's Mark a little bit. Um, I, I know you guys have a, a strong relationship with them. Uh, I, I recently saw uh, within the last day or two, I feel like um, there is a community bourbon release uh, yeah. that's happening. What, what's that all about? Yeah, so Maker's Mark, this is super cool because Maker's Mark has never done this before. And the thing about Maker's Mark is they have their liquid and it's always their liquid and it's always the same. Um, so Maker's Mark has a private select program where you can go down to this distillery as a restaurant and you take their cast strength and you add different staves to it. So the first time in history, they have blended bourbon. And so they took the recipes from 36 different restaurants that had made their own private select and they blended them and then they put them in vats and then they bottled them. There are 7,000 bottles of it. Um, it never entered into the three tiered system. It is a 100% donation. So when someone buys a bottle of this bourbon, 100% of it goes to the Lee initiative. Um, which first of all, like as a brand is incredible that they made this one-off liquid, but second, like the generosity, like I, I cry every time I talk about it. <laughs> so, That's incredible. Um, yeah. so yeah, I, I mean, I'm glad we, we, we can, uh, plug makers mark and, uh, even, even more of a reason if, 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 if their bourbon uh, and the quality of it wasn't already a reason to, to get some, um, yeah. you know, their involvement in this program and everything that they've done for, for the nation really um, through this is, is yeah, it really have. Yeah, it's really awesome. Um, so go out and get as much Maker's Mark as you can uh, <laughs> and uh, drink, res drink responsibly. Um, well, cool. Uh, that is all, that's all amazing stuff. Um, I am going to say it again, uh, leeinitiative.org to check out, uh, everything they're doing and to make a donation. Uh, it's, it's a really, really great cause and they're doing great things for, for the industry and people in need, uh, at Lee initiative on Instagram and at chef Edward Lee to follow chef Lee's, uh, Instagram. Is there anything else that you want to plug there, uh, Lindsay? I don't think so. Um, again, just thank you so much for having me on. Um, I've had a great time listening to the first nine episodes of your podcast. It's been incredible. I know that Jeff, our executive chef at 610 says nothing but the best about you. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to meet you, even if it's through Zoom, which I met probably, I don't know, 150 chefs via I can't wait uh, for 2022-ish. I will go on a road trip come and visit you. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jeff has been inviting me down to Louisville for a lot since he's left, uh, since he's left Charlottesville. And as soon as this is over, uh, I'm definitely going to find time to come down there and, uh, and check out the restaurant and meet you in person. Uh, and I'll probably get in touch with you offline after this to see, uh, how I might be able to contribute, uh, to the Lee initiative a little more directly. But uh, I am happy to uh, have you on the show and spread the word like this and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, it's it's really, really awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I you, you haven't uh, directly affected me with the relief efforts that you're doing, but I absolutely appreciate it uh, as somebody who is a part of the industry. It means a lot to me uh, to see you and, and all of the people involved uh, in working so hard to uh, to help our industry. Um, it's a beautiful thing. So thank you for, for that. And, and thank you for your time, uh, on kitchen brain. And, uh, I hope you stay well and hopefully we can talk again soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me and have a wonderful night. Thanks Lindsay. You as well. Kitchen brain. <laughs>